Good morning, everyone, and welcome. If you're just tuning in for the first time this morning, my name is Gene, and I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. I want to thank you for making C3 your choice this morning and inviting me into your home. It's kind of weird, isn't it? Today, we're going to be continuing in our series on the book of Romans. This is where we're looking at the book of Romans. It's a letter actually from Paul the Apostle to the church in Rome. But before we get started this morning, I have a very special announcement to make. It's that we are going to be gathering together for worship again starting on Sunday, May 17th. That's next week. We're really, really excited about it, but we want to do so safely and cautiously. Your safety and health is our primary concern. Also, we want to honor our government officials who have been working so hard for us and our first responders out there on the front lines. So, we have posted a set of guidelines for you at our website, c3naples.org. So I'm going to ask that before you come, please check that out. Again, c3naples.org. We want to do this right. Sunday, May 17th. I'm excited. We also understand that you may still have some concerns and you may feel safer at home. So if that's you, that's okay. We're going to be live streaming our services so you can watch right from the comfort of your home until you're ready to come out and join us. The book of Romans, one of the greatest theological works ever written. We're in chapter 4 today. Our series is titled, When in Rome. We learned about the premise, so I'll encourage you to go back and watch previous messages on that. Paul is writing to a church that he hasn't been to yet. It's one of the reasons it's called When in Rome, but there's another reason for it, so I'm going to encourage you to go ahead and check that out. Today, in Romans chapter 4, we're going to be talking about people of faith, some of the heroes of this faith, one in particular, so to speak, Abraham or Abram. He's kind of like a superhero of the faith, especially to the Jewish people. You know, I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like my own family doesn't appreciate some of the awesome stuff I do, but maybe some other people outside my family do. Do you feel like that sometimes? Especially you dads out there? Well, I know Jesus felt that. If you look at Mark chapter 6, you'll see that Jesus wasn't appreciated by his own family. He said, a prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown and by his own relatives. Well, nothing compared to Jesus. But unlike superheroes who can do all kinds of bad stuff, People remember all the good stuff about them all the time. It's their identity, what they can do, their special power. Today, 
we'll be looking at some of the heroes of the faith, these superheroes of the biblical account, so to speak. But we're going to see that they did some pretty messed up stuff. So they're kind of not much unlike you and I. Romans 3.23, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's only one true hero in our biblical account, and that's Jesus. Actually, we know that even superheroes have their kryptonite. Today, we'll be talking about faith. Paul uses Abraham as an example of someone whose faith was credited to him as righteousness, even before he did some pretty special things. In other words, the point being made is that we're not saved by the law or circumcision, these Jewish traditions that Paul is talking about. We're saved by God's grace through our faith in Jesus Christ. This is the point that Paul is going to be making. Now, one of these traditions included Abraham. So first, I want to take a look at who Abraham was. Now, if you didn't read the Bible, you're new here, you might not know about Abraham. He's not really talked about as much as some of the other people in the Old Testament. So I'm going to give you someone else that you might know about, and that's Noah. If you've never even been to church before, you probably know the stories about Noah. You probably know about the ark and the flood and the animals on the ark. <laughs> Must have been kind of rough. Well, anyway, Abraham, or Abram, and we'll get into that name change in our Bible study this week. He appears just a few chapters after Noah, but really it's a few hundred years. As there was a covenant with Noah, remember the rainbow? That was a symbol of the covenant. It was a covenant with Abraham too, and this is the covenant of circumcision. It's a sign of the covenant. We spoke about covenants before, so go back and watch those messages if you're a little confused. Basically, it's an agreement or arrangement that someone makes with God. We've also been talking about traditions. Now, you see, Abraham was so important to the Jewish people that a tradition developed that Abraham stood at the gates of hell. And if you were circumcised, he wouldn't even let you in. This can lead to some really bad thinking, as you can imagine. So as long as you're circumcised, you're all set. I guess you can do whatever you want. Now, some Christians also value their traditions as well. <laughs> I've heard some advice given to people, my wife in particular, before she came to the faith by someone who is more traditional, a different denomination. It was essentially this. Before you get baptized, wait. Wait till you're really, really old. And if you can pull it off, do so on your deathbed. Why? Because, well, once you get baptized, it just washes away all your sin, all the bad stuff you've ever done. Again, some pretty bad thinking. It kind of goes against the purpose of the whole faith. Now, like the Jewish tradition about Abraham, some Christians have traditions about Peter. He's also kind of a big deal. He's that lead apostle, the lead disciple of Jesus. Well, it says he has the keys to the kingdom of heaven. So some Christians believe that he's waiting right there at the pearly gates, the clouds, the angels playing the harps and all that stuff. And he has a list. And if you're on that list, he's going to let you in. So, just like the tradition about Abraham, it's also said of Peter. If you're on Peter's list, if you get baptized, you're washed, you're clean, you're all set. Again, Abraham, well, as long as you're circumcised, he'll keep you out of hell. Kind of bad thinking. But that's how big of a deal Abraham was to the Jewish people. So, using Abraham as an example here, it would have had a lot of gravity among the Jewish readers of this letter. It might actually cause some offense. Think about it. Well, now these Gentiles, they're a part of this lineage here. They're going to be kept out of hell, and they don't even have to get circumcised? Might have been really offensive. Paul notes that faith made Abraham right in God's eyes. And this happened before the covenant 
of circumcision. Or, much later, the law of Moses. Romans 4.1. He writes, So what are we going to say? Are we going to find that Abraham is our ancestor based on genealogy? Because if Abraham was made righteous because of his actions, he would have had a reason to brag, but not in front of God. What does the scripture say? Abraham had faith in God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Workers' salaries aren't credited to them on the basis of an employer's grace, but rather on the basis of what they deserve. But faith is credited as righteousness to those who don't work because they have faith in God who makes the ungodly righteous. Ephesians 2.8, really important, says this, You are saved by God's grace because of your faith. This salvation is God's gift. It's not something that you possessed. It's not something that you did, that you can be proud of. We talked about faith a couple weeks ago, and we saw the definition of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. Let me read that to you again. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is the reality of what we hope for, the proof of what we don't see. The elders in the past were approved because they showed faith. What's he talking about there? <laughs> well, these elders are heroes, so to speak, of the faith. He begins telling their stories. Abel. Enoch, and Noah that we talked about. Noah had a lot of faith to build that ark and kind of get in there with all those smelly animals. <laughs> now it speaks of Abram or Abraham and his wife, Sarah or Sarai. Here's what it says. Hebrews 11, starting at verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed, and when he was called to go out to a place that he was going to receive as an inheritance, he went out without knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived in the land he had been promised as a stranger. He lived in tents along with Isaac and Jacob, his son and his grandson, who were co-heirs of the same promise. He was looking forward to a city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, even Sarah received the ability to have a child, though she herself was barren and past the age for having children, because she believed that the one who promised was faithful. So descendants were born from one man, and he was as good as dead, 99 years old, actually. <laughs> they were as many as the number of stars in the sky and as countless as the grains of sand on the seashore. All these people died in faith without receiving the promises, but they saw the promises from a distance and welcomed them. They confessed that they were strangers and immigrants on the earth. People who say this kind of thing make it clear that they are looking for a homeland. If they had been thinking about the country that they had left, they would have had, had the opportunity to return to it. But at this point in time, they are longing for a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God isn't ashamed to be called their God. He has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham offered Isaac when he was tested. The one who received the promises was offering his only son. He had been told concerning him, your legitimate descendants will come from Isaac. He figured that God could even raise him from the dead. So in a way, he did receive him back from the dead. Many of you know that story. Abraham, when called, offered up Isaac as a sacrifice. Well, the angel stopped him, but still he was willing to go through with it. So these people are kind of like heroes of the faith. But are heroes always faithful? Paul writes to Timothy, 2 Timothy 2, starting at verse 11. This saying is reliable. If we have died together, we'll also live together. If we endure, we will also rule together. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he stays faithful because he can't be anything else than what he is. Now, denying Jesus is something called apostasy. It's kind of bad, <laughs> yet being faithless represents a lack of trust, which is something every Christian experiences at one point or another. Paul says, even if we are faithless, including himself, we see in Genesis when we look at the chapters about Abraham and Sarah that they weren't always faithful. Yeah, they're like superheroes of the faith, but even superheroes have their kryptonite. Maybe you know of another 
biblical story about Moses and the Exodus. You probably know about it. Maybe you've seen a movie. You get the basic premise. They're enslaved in Egypt. Let my people go, he says, over and over and over again, so they can go out in the wilderness and worship God. Well, Pharaoh says no, so God puts plagues on them, afflicts them with all these plagues, and eventually he lets them go. And they take a whole bunch of silver and gold and stuff on their way out. Well, I bet maybe you don't know that this isn't the first time that happened in the Bible. You see, that's Exodus 12. If we go back to Genesis 12, you see, it begins the story of Abraham. Now, Abraham set out for that promised land. We know that from the scriptures we read. He arrives in Egypt, and as he does, he tells his wife, Sarah, you know what, when we get there, I'm going to need you to tell everybody that you're my sister. That's weird. It's his wife. Kind of gross. We'll get into a little more on that at Bible study, but here's his reasoning. You're beautiful. She's 65 years old. No jokes. I want to play that one safe. You're beautiful. They're going to kill me if they find out you're my wife. So say you're my sister. She agrees to it. And you know what happens? Pharaoh takes a liking to her and takes her in as his wife. Ugh. Well, God afflicts him with plagues. Pharaoh figures it out. He's like, what are you doing? Abram, you're crazy. Gives the wife back, lets him keep all the gold and stuff he amassed, and sends him on his way. It's kind of not very faithful, is it? Well, that's not the last time Abraham does that same thing. King Abimelech, same thing happens. <laughs> Abraham's afraid, tells his wife, tell everybody you're my sister. Same thing, but God doesn't afflict him with plagues. He warns him in a dream about what he did. Abimelech wants to make it right, and he makes a covenant with his Abraham. But still, it doesn't sound like a very faithful thing to do, does it? You see, these heroes, as we can see, are not much different from us. This is kind of what Paul is saying in this section of Romans. We're in need of a Savior. We'll see that pretty soon. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. Before any of these works or things that we did, faith. Now, some people will say, I don't have any faith at all. I'm here to say, I bet you do. Think about it. Through this whole thing, maybe you've gotten sick. Maybe you know people who've gotten sick, but I bet I know what you would do if you felt sick and started coming down with any kinds of symptoms. You'd go to the doctor. Well, what happens when you go to the doctor besides wait forever and ever and ever and fill out a bunch of paperwork? Once that's over, you go to the waiting room and you wait there where you're going to get checked out. A nurse usually comes in. Maybe she pokes you with needles, takes your blood pressure, does all kinds of tests, sticks things in your ears, and your nose, whatever, in your mouth. It's a very invasive process. I bet you don't ask about her credentials. The doctor comes in. He checks you out. He gives you a diagnosis. I bet you don't ask for his credentials either. It's even worse in the hospital. There's even more people checking us out. We never ask them for their credentials. We assume they're all good. Then you go to the pharmacy. What do you do there? Well, you give the prescription that the doctor filled out for you, trusting in him. Someone fills that prescription, gives you drugs. <laughs> you take those drugs. You didn't ask for their credentials either. That sounds like a whole lot of faith to me. Think about it. Now, here's what I'm going to say. It's not about how much faith you have. You have a lot of faith in that. It's about where you put your faith. That really matters. Let me expand on that idea. It's about the object of our faith. Let's say you need surgery. Well, it's a pretty important thing. So you're going to meet with the surgeon, the doctor, and maybe you meet with a certain doctor. 
It's pretty fancy. He's got one of those big executive desks and the big chairs that make you feel like a little kid. I think they do that on purpose. Anyway, he's got all the degrees on his wall from Harvard. He's got the Harvard ring, maybe a really nice wristwatch on. He's got a really fancy suit on him, one of those lab coat type things with his name on it and all the other stuff in the pocket protector. He looks pretty important. Maybe he's a handsome younger guy. Well, that seems legit. This is really going to work out. I can believe him. Maybe you go home and you start thinking, I don't know, this is a pretty big deal. I might want to do some research. So you get a second opinion. You go to another doctor. But this doctor's different. He doesn't look like the first doctor. Maybe he's kind of old. Maybe he looks like Doc from Back to the Future. A little weird and disheveled. He's not wearing a lab coat with a name on it. Maybe he has a goofy sweater vest on. He can't see the certificates on the wall. He don't know where he got his degree. You're not going to put a whole bunch of faith in him, are you? But you go home and you figure, man, I really got to research these guys because this is really, really important. Come to find out, well, that younger doctor, he's just fresh out of med school. He's only done this operation a few times and he has all the nice stuff because he comes from a rich family. Then you find out the other doctor who didn't look so good, well, he's done this surgery hundreds of times and he really doesn't care what you think of him. He knows he has a good reputation and he knows what he's doing. This is kind of what Christianity is like. It doesn't always look good when you first look at it, but when you do your research and you check it out, you find out that this is the best worldview there is. It's historically credible. We talked about that on Easter. So go back and check out that message. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that today, but my point is this. We have faith first because of what Jesus did. It's historical reliability. He rose from the dead. We saw that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's really, really important. You see, we learn by what we've heard, by preaching. Romans 10 will say that. We have to hear and be intelligent about it first. We don't want to just have blind faith. Dr. William Lane Craig calls this a reasonable faith. We're going to check that out when we see Romans 10. But Luke also says it. He says he interviewed eyewitnesses. He checked it out. He did his homework. He says it again in Acts. It's important. We're not called to have a blind faith. We're called to check it out. We saw that in Acts when Paul visits with the Bereans. They search the scriptures to see if what he's saying is really true. So this is an important first step. It's not the only thing, but it's a building block. Again, getting this information in our minds is important, but it has to get to our hearts. It's one way we can build up our faith. We also build up our faith through the church. Ephesians 4.11. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. His purpose was to equip God's people for the work of serving and building up the body of Christ until we all reach the unity of faith and knowledge of God's Son. God's goal is for us to become mature adults, to be fully grown, measured by the standard of the fullness of Christ. Another way we can build up our faith is through a relationship with God that comes through prayer. Jesus helps us in our unbelief. See, there's a story that occurs in Mark chapter 9. Right after Jesus comes off the mountain being transfigured, I encourage you to read that on your own. He comes down the mountain and he runs into a scene. There's a man whose boy is demon-possessed. His son is demon-possessed. Now, the disciples, they couldn't cast it out. They were trying. Jesus says, oh, you unbelieving generation, how long will I put up with you? How long will I endure you? Well, he asked the man what's going on. The man says, if you can help me, please do so. Jesus says, if I can, everything is possible to the one who believes. Well, the man says something interesting. He says, I do believe. Help me in my unbelief. That's a weird statement. Well, it's about the object of your faith. The man's faith wasn't strong, but he put it in Jesus. He says, help me, Jesus. Well, Jesus heals the boy. He casts the demon out. Later, the disciples ask him, why couldn't we do it, Jesus? And he says, well, 
This kind cannot come out without prayer. What is he pointing to? Well, you need faith. Yes. But you need that relationship with God. It's about the object of your faith and prayer. Let me ask you a question. Are you afraid of heights? I'm not afraid to say that I'm afraid of heights. Now, I wasn't always afraid of heights, and I can't really tell you where and when I developed this fear. And I was a kid, I used to climb trees. Later on in life, I got up on roofs and cleaned the leaves off and things like that. I didn't like it, but I wasn't afraid. Well, you see, I first discovered how afraid I was of heights one day when I was invited to volunteer at church for something. Now, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Sometimes we're not going to let you know why you got to come to church to volunteer so you can't back out. That's exactly what happened to me. They called me in. They said, Gene, we just need you to help out with something. I didn't ask. I had faith. <laughs> I went to the church. In our old building, we had these really high cathedral ceilings in one room. Really, really high. I walked in, and there was a ladder propped up. And it seemed like it went all the way to the top of the ceiling. It's kind of scary. They wanted me to help hang a banner. They had the tools ready and everything. And instead of saying, that looks really scary and I could get hurt. I don't want to do it. Nope. <laughs> I pretended to be brave. We talked about that a couple weeks ago, remember? So I put on the tool belt and I started climbing the ladder. Now, if I'm exaggerating, I got up about six feet and I froze. I couldn't make my hands move. I was frozen. I was literally paralyzed. Well, I stuck there for about an you uncomfortable know, 60 seconds before they told me, Gene, get down off the ladder. <laughs> Wouldn't it have better, been better if I said, I'm kind of afraid, instead of striking out, like I talked about a couple of weeks ago when I got up to the plate. Now, people will often give you advice when you get up on a ladder. I'm sure you're already saying it. Don't look down. Well, this pertains to ladders and also our faith. It applies to our walk with Jesus. We must keep our eyes fixed on him. Maybe you know of another story in the Bible. You've probably heard of it, even if you haven't read the Bible. It occurs in Matthew chapter 14. Jesus is walking on water. The disciples see him. They think it's a ghost. They're afraid. Oh, what will we do? Jesus says, don't be afraid. It's me, Peter, the lead disciple. He gets up and he says, Jesus, if you call me out on the water, I'll come. Jesus says, come. Peter does a pretty incredible thing. It's going to be pointed out that he lacked faith. But think about all the other disciples that were freaking out. He actually gets out of the boat and he begins to walk on the water. Unbelievable. But he sees, he saw that the wind was very great. The waves are crashing. He notices the storm and he begins to sink. He says, help me, Jesus. Jesus is faithful when we're faithless. He helps Peter out of the water and says, why do you lack faith? Well, do you notice something? Peter sank when he took his eyes off of Jesus. Peter looked down, so to speak. Hebrews 12.1. So then, with endurance, let's also run the race that is laid out in front of us. Since we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let's throw off any extra baggage, get rid of the sin that trips us up, and fix our eyes on Jesus. Faith's pioneer and perfecter. He endured the cross, ignoring the shame for the sake of the joy that was laid out in front of him and sat down at the right side of God's throne. You see, we all have fears. And sometimes we lack faith. So we rely on the one and only true biblical hero. That is Jesus Christ. We need to fix our eyes on him. Don't look down. Don't look back. Pressing forward to the prize that is in Jesus Christ. I want to leave you with some scriptural encouragement today. Philippians 3.13 Brothers and sisters, I myself don't think I've reached it, but I do this one thing. 
I forget about the things behind me and reach out for the things ahead of me. The goal I pursue is the prize of God's upward call in Christ Jesus. Again, I'm looking forward to gathering again together on May 17th. We want to do so safely. So visit c3naples.org. Check out those guidelines before you come. We're excited. Also, if you still feel safer at home, that's fine too. We're going to be live streaming the service. c3naples.org. Looking forward to seeing you. We'll save a seat for you. Thank you.